So let's get started. Hello again, my friends, and welcome to night two of this week's devotion series. Uh, I promised you things would go smoother as we went along with these, and I'm really happy that I'm getting to keep that promise. Um, last night's video has already been uploaded to YouTube, so go and check that out if you feel so led. Now, like last week, or the last time we did these, we didn't do them last week. Anyway, uh, I've got people I want to talk about, but I don't want to talk about them in any particular order. So we're going to cover them in the order in which they appear in Scripture. So last night we talked about our Egyptian midwives, we talked about Shifra, and we talked about Pua, and honestly, I was just looking for another reason to say their names again. Found it! Tonight, though, we are going to talk about another First Testament character, and her name is Abishag. Now, who was she again? Well, the first thing we have to do before we get into her story is give credit where credit is due. I don't want to sound shocked when I say this. But God came through again while I was working on this night of devotions. See, I had made big plans to just go ahead and talk about Nathan the prophet tonight. Uh, he gets some credit because of his part in the saga of David and Bathsheba, but I thought he might deserve a little bit more attention. While looking into him, though, I found a name I'd never noticed before. And let me say this again because I cannot say it enough. The Bible was originally in an oral format because it happened in an oral culture. So people passed the Bible down by retelling the events and eventually they were written down. And in this ancient oral culture, names held a very high and important place. So when a name is used for a secondary or even a third -alary, that's not a word, but moving along. When they're used for a secondary or a th third part character, we need to pay very close attention. And that is what we find in 1 Kings chapter 1. And we're actually just going to start reading in verse 1. Now King David was old and advanced in years. And although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. Therefore his servants said to him, Let a young woman be sought for my lord the king, and let her wait on the king and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms, that my lord the king may be warm. So they sought for a beautiful young woman throughout all the territory of Israel, and found Abishag the Shunammite, and brought her to the king. The young woman was very beautiful, and she was of service to the king, and attended to him, but the king knew her not. So now you know who Abishag was. She was a comforter as in someone who provides comfort, but also as in a large blanket that covers people and keeps them warm. But this isn't the only time that Abishag comes up. She appears to us again in chapter 2. Now, David's son Adonijah has just made a move to steal the kingdom from his ailing father, but Nathan and Bathsheba, out of respect for their king and their friend, David, they speak to the old man and remind him of Solomon's place on the throne. After a bunch of political things happen, Solomon is named the king, and we see Adonijah approach Bathsheba and ask her to ask Solomon a question for him. And verse 17 of chapter 2 says, that Adonijah asked, please ask King Solomon. He will not refuse you to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife. When Bathsheba asks the king, this is how he responds. And why do you ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is my older brother, and on his side are Abiathar the priest and Joab the son of Zeruiah. Then King Solomon swore by the Lord, saying, God, do so to me and more, if this word does not cost Adonijah his life. Now, if you're confused, you are not the only one. 
okay? I did not get this at all. Why was wanting to marry the sweet, pretty little Abishag a request that was worthy of death? So I looked into it, and we need to understand two things about this story. The first one is the historical significance. You may remember David's son Absalom, who tried to overthrow his father and take over the kingdom. One of his main political moves was to be seen publicly going in to his father's concubines. And that's basically the biblical equivalent to Netflix and chill. Moving on. This was a political and revolutionary move on the part of Absalom. Claiming a right to his father's wives was his declaration of his right to rule. If the king can't keep his women going, how's he supposed to keep a country going? You know what I mean? And that brings us back to Abishag. Now, the Bible tells us that David knew her not, which is Bible speak for not practicing the horizontal tango, but she was still a prominent woman who provided a very intimate service to the king. So Adonijah's request for her hand was a move to be recognized as the rightful heir to the throne. After all, he had already gained support from the people because he was David's oldest child. And with the acquisition of Abishag, he would have had the social status of being married to one of the queen's, one of the king's women. The revolution would have been easy and Solomon's fall would have been quick. So now we know the historical significance, but what is the spiritual significance? Why do we need to know about Abishag? When Abishag reaches all the way into our lives in 2018, what does she want us to learn from her story? You, me too, but you need to be very aware at all times of how, where, and by whom you are being used. At the beginning of this story, our dear Abishag is being used. She is bringing peace, comfort, and love to a failing king. A king who had done a mostly good job of keeping her land and her people protected. And now she was returning the favor. Then along comes Adonijah, and he wants to use the young and beautiful Abishag as well, but for a very different reason. He wants to use her in the sense of deplete. Now, the original Hebrew for the context of Abishag's relationship with David, David is that of ministering. She ministered to him. To Adonijah, she was just a pawn. The Hebrew language context for their almost relationship, interestingly, shares a root with the word for ministering, but it simply means to wife. Isn't that great, first of all, to wife? And if you know anything about biblical culture, you know that you lost all of your individuality and importance the minute you began to wife. You became a second-rate citizen at best. Now, I am fairly certain you have areas in your life where you are being used. I know I do. What Abishag would have us know and beg us to remember is that you need to examine those areas, those relationships, and see which way are you being used. Are you ministering to them? Do your co-workers receive a ministry from you that you freely give? Do your children get your love as a mother because you give it, because you love them? They take it, but you give it first. Or are you becoming a to-be? Do you quit being the you that God made and become someone whose only purpose is to friend or to listen or to abuse, or to work, or to wife. We have Abishag's name in our Bible because she was Abishag. If she had married Adonijah, she would have been erased as a person and simply become Adonijah's wife. 
ministering to people, being someone that people want to bring their hurts and their troubles to, that is such a blessing. It is a wonderful gift from God to be able to speak his peace over the lives of others. But don't ever let anybody reduce you to a noun, a person, a place, or a thing. Because you are a proper noun. You are the person. You exist in this place. And God made you to do your thing. Your ministry. In 2 Timothy 1.6, Paul says, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. And it is our time to step up and fan the flame so that we can keep our king warm with our ministry. Like dear sweet Abishag. Now who is she again? I'm just kidding. I know. Hey, let's pray. Father God, we come to you tonight with praise on our lips. You are the one who created us to be the beautiful and fantastic individuals that we are. We are flawed, yes. But when you look at us, you see the perfection of your son. Thank you. Lord, I pray that we would start to see ourselves the way you see us. You see us as children, as royalty, as redeemed, sanctified, beloved treasures. And you are truth, so that is truth. We are who you say we are. I pray that we also start to change our self-talk. Instead of voicing the things we believe about ourselves or the things that society tells us about ourselves, I pray we would instead start to learn and know the truths you speak over us and speak them to our own hearts. We are yours, made in your image, made fearfully and wonderfully. I also pray fervently tonight, Father, that we would quit spitting lies on the people around us. We need to stop reducing our neighbors to to-be statements. They are yours as well, also made in your image and fearfully and wonderfully made. And as people who call on your name, Lord, we should not abide injustice, we should not abide suicide, and we should not abide gossip or any talk that does not give grace to the people who hear it. Continue to grow us into people who warm those around us with the light of love. We pray all these things in the name of the God who sees us, El Roy. In the name of the God who called his people by name and gave new names of liberation to his children when they were burdened under old signs. We pray all these things in the name of that God. Amen.